But first, 50 years ago this month, Congress overrode a veto from President Nixon and approved the Clean Water Act. It was the most sweeping environmental legislation ever passed regarding lakes, rivers, and wetlands, expanding the government's ability, rather, to regulate water pollution and water quality. The person more responsible than anyone else for making the Clean Water Act the law of the land was Maine Senator Ed Muskie. And on this anniversary of the Clean Water Act, Muskie's enormous contributions have not been forgotten. To appreciate what the Androscoggin River is like today, you have to look back to what it was in the middle part of the 20th century. What kind of condition would this river have been in 50 years ago? Uh, it was awful. I think but in the 1950s and 1960s, it was, we wouldn't be standing here. We wouldn't want to be this close to the river. It was that foul and polluted. It's important to talk about what would be dumped into the rivers before this yeah. bill came along. Sewage, Municipal sewage. For one thing. Pretty much just sewage. untreated sewage. All the towns were dumping in just their sewage, and it was just going to the ocean. These toxic stews that came out of mills Paper along mills. the rivers. Yeah, awful. And, and there was a lot of it. And there was a lot of it, and that stuff it eats up all the oxygen in the water. And so there's, there's like big dead zones where there, no fish could live. So there was sections of this river. I've, I've spoken to some wardens who used to, to be responsible for parts of the Androscoggin. They would get in their boat, go out, and they would literally throw up. It smelled so bad, and they would, there was no fish. The national debate about water pollution took on a new urgency in 1969 when the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland was so contaminated with toxic chemicals that it literally caught fire. At that time, Senator Ed Muskie had been working on clean water legislation for four years with little to show for it. This wasn't something that happened quickly, was it? No, it wasn't. He would use some of his old tricks that he says he learned uh, at Bates from uh, his debate coach, Brooks Quimby, um, of letting people talk, letting the other, letting someone who maybe d isn't going to support you initially talk, tell me your reasons why you don't like this, let's, let's talk about it, and hearing them out, and then sort of countering, either gently or forcefully in his, in his musky way, to get them over to at least see that this was a bill that they could, they could create together rather than I'm going to dictate the terms to you. The argument against the bill was one that we hear many times, it's going to cost jobs, it's going to cost too much money, but really it's going to kill jobs. And did that turn out to be the case or not? <laughs> you know, really the opposite. I mean, the, the, the Clean Water Act, I would say, is one of our most important economic successes. And if you think back the way it was in the 50s and 60s, I mean, everybody was fearful of even falling into the waters. Now we've got restaurants and businesses who are buying up riverfront properties. I mean, look at this park and this walkway in the town of Lewiston and Auburn. They embrace being next to a clean river. It's part of their new identity. For seven years, Muskie called on all his legislative skills, a mix of patience, determination, and logic to keep pushing the idea of clean water legislation through Congress. When his bill was finally presented in 1972, the Senate approved it by a vote of 86 to zero. I think it speaks to the efforts that, the, that he and his staff had done to, to make a bill that was a real compromise bill, but not with any sort of the pejorative terms that we think of with compromise. The goal of the Clean Water Act, and correct me if I'm wrong, was to make these waters, waters of American rivers, swimmable and fishable. Have we achieved that goal? Well, I mean, it's been a huge success. So this summer, Augusta had a Ironman triathlon, and the athletes swam a mile of the Kennebec right next to their river trail. That was through areas that in the mid-1960s, no one would have done that. Uh, in fact, there was, there was reports that I've seen of like thousands of dead fish in that section of the river. It's easy to be cynical in this age, in this bitterly divided, polarized political world in which we live. But we really should celebrate the 50th anniversary really of celebrate. the Clean Water Act. It really changed the way we live, didn't it? I think, hands down, it's the most important, for Maine, the most important national environmental law. And throughout 
I would say the last 50 years, the Clean Water Act and the implementation of it here in the state has been a nonpartisan issue. Whenever there are broad social changes, there are always a lot of people involved. It's never the work of one person. But if you have to give credit to just one person for the Clean Water Act, it's Ed Muskie. He's the champion of champions of, of this law, no question. And the issue of clean water wasn't an abstract one for Ed Muskie. It was deeply personal. He grew up in the 19-teens and 20s in Rumford, a paper mill town on the Androscoggin, and the river there at that time was filthy. There is actually a memorial to Muskie in Rumford, which notes his many accomplishments, including, of course, the Clean Water Act. And it wasn't just the Androscoggin that was transformed by that law. So were the Penobscot and Kettybunk and many other rivers here in Maine. And one other note, the Clean Water Act is by no means the only part of Ed Muskie's towering environmental legacy. He played a major role in the passage of the Clean Air Act, which has been called perhaps the most important environmental law in American history. And apparently he was actually prouder of that, felt that was more important than even the Clean Water Act. Wow, well, both very important. Remarkable legacy. Absolutely.